Okay, today we're going to put together the entire knowledge that we have about quantum dots and semiconductors uh, to discuss this topic, which is uh, ongoing research, very recent and uh, uh, very high profile, uh, trying to make qubits out of uh, spins confined to uh, quantum dots. I'm uh, uh, very grateful to Professor Hendrik Bloom and to Professor Levin van der Seypen for many of the slides that I will use here. Um, Hendrik's uh, research uh, that I will discuss was done at Harvard in the group of Amir Yacobi. Uh, so whenever slides are from Harvard, that's likely from uh, Hendrik Bloom. And uh, whenever slides are from Delft, those are either from me or from uh, Levin. And we will uh, discuss uh, two types of qubits today. Single spin qubits, that's easy, spin up, spin down, but also singlet triplet qubits. They are spin qubits which are defined out of states of two electrons. So if you want singlets and triplets, you need two electrons. Um, and uh, those qubits are actually at the current stage more advanced than single spin qubits. So they are very important. But let me start actually with not the spin qubit, with the charge qubit. That's the easiest one to understand. If you remember uh, double quantum dot structures uh, in gallium arsenide defined by gates, uh, here with the two dots, they indicate uh, where the two dots are. Uh, one qubit that comes to mind is um, a superposition of electron being on the left dot and on the right dot. So a superposition of two charge states, or two states of a particle in space. Uh, that's the, uh, the most basic superposition. Um, you can uh, represent that superposition on a block sphere, uh, just like spin. Remember, for any qubit, you can define a block sphere. And uh, on the poles of that uh, block sphere, you can put right and left for charge being on the right. A charge being on the left. Uh, and at the equator in this uh, plane, you will have all uh, equal superpositions of charge on the left and on the right with a different phase. Yeah. And then the entire superposition space forms a block sphere. Uh, you can um, define a detuning axis between 1, 0 and 0, 1 states. So remember, you have the triple points in double quantum dots. And perpendicular to uh, charge lines, we have the detuning axis where we sweep energy levels of 0, 1, and 1, 0 with respect to each other. We detune them. Uh, and as we go along this line, we are moving the electron from the left dot to the right dot. Uh, and in terms of energy, uh, that's what's happening. Um, as you detune, the 1, 0 becomes, from a ground state, becomes the excited state. And 0, 1 from the excited state becomes the ground state, because you're detuning the two levels with gates, with gate electrodes. Um, but at uh, the degeneracy point, the two quantum dots are coupled. The two wave functions and the two dots uh, overlap. And uh, this tunnel coupling uh, produces this avoided level crossing, anti-crossing, or level repulsion. Those are all the same thing. Um, and that tells you that around this point, if you let, let the system stay here, it will precess between 0, 1, and 1, 0. You can observe coherent oscillations between 1, 0, and 0, 1, so electron being on the left and on the right. When you do a Rabi experiment, a Rabi experiment, to manipulate the charge around the block sphere. So there are several experiments done in this system on charge qubits. This is one of the recent ones from uh, a group at Princeton, a group of uh, Jason Petta. Um, and they demonstrate uh, Rabi oscillations, coherent oscillations of a single charge between the two dots. Uh, these are these oscillations here. What can we learn about these oscillations? Um, 
we can learn two things. These oscillations are quite fast. This is a one nanosecond time scale. So in that time scale, you fit three or four oscillations. It means a single qubit gate, which is uh, if you want to flip a qubit, that's half of this oscillation. You can do six of those in a nanosecond. A uh, pi over two pulse to prepare maximum superposition, go from this to this on the block sphere of charge. Those you can do 12 of uh, in, this, in this period. You can also learn that it's a short-lived qubit. After two nanoseconds, there are no more oscillations. So the, whatever you want to do, first of all, you have to do it real fast because uh, qubit dephases very fast. And actually, you cannot do too much. You can do, here you have five oscillations, maybe six. So you can do maybe 24 gates max. And for quantum computing, you need hundreds and thousands of gates. Um, this is actually the reason why people turned to spin very early on, and actually even before these experiments came up. Because uh, for spin, people anticipated uh, much longer coherence. And here is sort of a worst case for charge and the best case for spin combined in one slide. So maybe it's not fair, and it's certainly not the current experimental situation. Uh, but uh, this is what is a motivation for the field of spin qubits. And so this is where we want to come to, ultimately. So for charges, uh, we actually have uh, a lot of problems uh, with charges because sitting in a semiconductor, quantum dot, charge is susceptible to the environment very strongly. All the gates that create this confinement, that keep the charge there, uh, they all have voltages on them. And so any fluctuations in those voltages will translate into fluctuations in the superposition of charges immediately. And there is no protection against that. So charge noise on the gates is a problem. Semiconductors themselves have charge noise. Because you have a, in a gallium arsenide, a gas of two-dimensional electrons that's created by some donors that sit on top of it. So if those donors jump around, uh, if uh, extra charges jump on donors, uh, you have uh, intrinsic charge noise in the material itself. And then uh, mm -hmm. photons and phonons, all of that also, whatever moves the electron in space, immediately translates into decoherence in a charge qubit. So universally, charge qubits are uh, considered uh, a very bad qubits. Uh, very interesting system to study, but uh, to build a quantum computer, very bad because decoherence is so easy to induce and so hard to fight. Now with spin, well, um, unless you have super strong spin orbit interaction, spin sitting in a quantum dot does not couple to anything. Um, spin um, like that, I mean like uh, the charges. So spins don't care about gates, you can shift it around and the spin will still stay up. Uh, spins um, are not so sensitive to uh, phonons. Um, and um, in the best experiments, uh, these are not done on single spins, but uh, uh, in the bulk on electron or nuclear spins, people have observed coherence times of approaching seconds or even exceeding seconds for, for nuclei. So these degrees of freedom, which are fundamentally quantum, two-level systems, remain coherent for much longer. But that's when we have, a, for example, in this case, a, a sample of silicon is a big piece. And uh, we find maybe one spin there and uh, try to study it, or even just an ensemble of spins, a bunch of impurities in a big chunk of silicon. Uh, that's not a qubit. We need to uh, control single spins, read them out, and do all the DiVincenzo criteria from last lecture on this degree of freedom. And uh, that is uh, what the lecture will be about, um, how to 
inspired by these numbers, do the experiments, what is the technical aspect of achieving single spin control in semiconductors, and uh, demonstrating single spin qubits. So this is a slide uh, which shows the DiVincenzo criteria, but now applied to qubits made of spin. The first idea to use spins and quantum dots as uh, qubits came uh, in this very famous paper by Loth and DiVincenzo. The same DiVincenzo who came up with the criteria, then he said, uh, together with Daniel Loth, uh, well, it could be that these kind of spins in gate-defined quantum dots or other coupled quantum dots uh, could be a good system to realize these criteria. Um, these are the methods that you might want to use to uh, realize uh, DiVincenzo criteria. Remember, you have to initialize in a well-defined state like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And one way to do that comes to mind is uh, just wait for the spin relaxation time. Uh, whatever that time is, uh, T1, just wait for a few times T1 and spins will all flip into the ground state. And that will be the starting point. Um, there are ideas for how to read out spins and uh, that is actually a very clever uh, trick. Basically it is very difficult to read out a single spin because the magnetic moment of that spin is so small. So magnetic readout is difficult. Magnetometers that we have um, have only recently approached single spin resolution and it takes something like one hour of averaging to tell whether the spin is there or not. And for qubits, for quantum computing, we need single shot readout. We want to do some manipulation on spins and then ask, okay, are you up or down? Tell me now not in four hours or something like that. So that didn't work. Magnetometry is too weak. But in quantum dots, we have this amazing way to convert spin into charge information. And I will tell you how that's done. There are a couple different ways. Basically, you set up the energy levels in a quantum dot in a, such a way that if spin is up, for example, it is trapped in a dot. But if spin is down, it escapes. And so you measure charge, whether the electron is there or not. But what you're learning about is spin. So spin to charge conversion is a method of readout. And then we already know how to do a single qubit gate on one spin, do a spin resonance, like electron spin resonance, or uh, electric dipole spin resonance. So apply some microwave uh, field, microwave manipulation. <coughs> And a two qubit gate, for the case of single spin qubit, well, that could be uh, just a coupling of two electrons, coupling of their wave functions. So in today's lecture, I will show you that all of these building blocks can be realized. And uh, at the end of the lecture, we will know all the performances of these building blocks and uh, the relevant times, and we will make a conclusion for where we need to go to make it into a practical qubit platform, so to do real quantum computation. Just to refresh your memory, um, I haven't been showing these kind of slides for a long time, uh, but this is where the experiments on uh, quantum dots are done in dilution refrigerators. This one is from Harvard, from the group of Amir Yacobi. Um, and uh, the sample sits uh, on, the, this is a chip, a few millimeters in a, uh, on a side. And uh, the chip is connected by bonding wires. You can see a couple of them to these uh, strips uh, on, a, on a sample holder board. And some of these strips, uh, like these here, are for delivering high frequency signals uh, in a microwave range, so they require uh, microwave engineering. You cannot send very efficiently uh, gigahertz signals over just simple lines. There will be some losses or resonances. So to deliver smoothly the microwaves, you need microwave waveguides. So you do little microwave calculations and they tell you what the shape of these uh, 
microwave lines should be. These simple lines uh, are likely for just static or very slow gates that confine electrons. And then um, microwave lines are for manipulation of spins. Then uh, this uh, piece is attached here to a, a piece of copper, sometimes called the cold finger, because it is elongated and uh, it is uh, very cold at the base temperature. Uh, millikelvins, and uh, the reason why it's elongated is it has to go into a big magnet. So the the big magnet that creates Tesla fields necessary for spin uh, control uh, goes around this this fridge. It's a it could be a solenoid magnet, so a huge coil with a bunch of turns, and it's superconducting. Because if you want to create a Tesla field with copper wire, there will be so much heating that it will warm up this entire system. And so the cold finger sits at the bottom. And bottom to top, in this dilution refrigerator, we have uh, uh, different levels of temperature. At the bottom, the coldest, in this case 25 millikelvin, but these things go to the best case, maybe 5 millikelvin. Um, and then uh, gradually, Kelvin, 4 Kelvin, room temperature uh, go like that. So you come in with your signals from room temperature, and they have to uh, come down uh, and uh, cool down. The lines that you use have to cool down to all these different temperatures before they reach uh, the base. So I thought this was a very nice slide to remind you of the machinery that we have to use to, to do these experiments. And uh, we need low temperatures because we want to absorb quantum effects, right? We want to overcome uh, temperature broadening and um, see uh, quantum levels and things like that. So for example, in a, in a quantum dot, we will not see discrete uh, levels, excited states, if we are above a certain temperature. Resonances and quantum point contacts um, also are quantum interference effects. And therefore, um, if you go to higher temperature, quantum point contact plateaus become more smooth uh, because you kill that interference. You overcome it by temperature. So, so you by all, for all kinds of reasons, you need a low temperature. And also for qubits to create efficient initialization, for example, to uh, have a um, clear difference between the ground state and the excited state and prevent thermal excitations from ground state to the excited state. And now we're zooming in again uh, on that chip, which is a uh, few by few millimeters on the side. A gallium arsenide heterostructure with gates. Um, this slide demonstrates how you can do spin readout and it's a single shot spin readout. So you load an electron, and then you learn of its spin for each electron that you load. So amazing ultimate accuracy. And the mechanism for that is spin to charge conversion. You have to follow a certain protocol. Uh, first of all, you want to create an energy difference between spin up and spin down. Here they do it in the simplest way possible. They apply a large magnetic field, 10 Tesla, and they overcome thermal broadening. So 10 Tesla would be um, a few times the KBT. Um, so um, in gallium arsenide, I think one Tesla is, I want to say, 25 microvolts. So 10 Tesla would be 250 microvolts. And at the uh, temperature of 25 millikelvin, you're going to be at uh, maybe 25 microvolts. So you are 10 times at least, maybe more. So you create an energy difference between spin up and spin down. Spin up is the ground state because the G factor of gallium arsenide is the lowest energy state. Spin down is the excited state. And uh, you uh, make a very small dot, so you just have two levels here. But initially, you pulse them with a gate all the way up. You use this gate, sometimes called a plunger, to plunge the electron out. 
plunge it out means uh, levels are above the chemical potential of the lead. And it, this dot has one lead, by the way. We often looked at dots that had two leads for transport from here to here to here. But this constriction is so closed that uh, it is as if uh, this is not accessible. But you can go this way. So you are sure that there is no electron in the dot. On this side, you have a sensor for charge. It's a quantum point contact biased to the transition between the two plateaus. So you are at this steep part where if you change the gate voltage, you get a large change in conductance. So you are doing charge sensing. And even adding one electron to this dot would uh, shift the potential in this quantum point contact. So the initial level in a quantum point contact is like that, empty dot. Then you bring the levels down. You take these levels and bring them down because you want an electron to go in. Well, the first thing you see is that uh, there is a signal. Right at the time when you apply this pulse, there is a signal. That's just a direct coupling from the gate to the charge sensor. Because this uh, charge sensor is not only sensitive to this electron, but to all these potentials around it. So we lowered the energy levels here by applying a gate voltage. Uh, we see that pulse itself. But then after some time, the signal decreased a little bit. And that's because an electron came into the dot. So this little charge, this little event, is the electron filling the dot. Now, this point can be anywhere. It's a stochastic process. So from time to time, this point will be at different uh, times. And uh, you can even uh, deduce the, the tunneling rate from the distribution of these events. Now, there are two possibilities. Uh, this electron could have gone into the spin down level or into the spin up level. If we do it much faster than the spin relaxation time, then uh, both are the possibility. If we wait in this situation for a long time and then try to read out, for sure electron will be in a ground state. But let's say we do it fast enough. So then we bring the levels up. But not as high as here, uh, just such that one of the levels is below this, and the other one is above. So then the excited state electron can leave, but the ground state electron is trapped. So if we have a ground state electron with spin up, in this new level, nothing will happen. The electron will not leave. If we have an excited state electron, there will be a little signal here. You will see it's of the opposite sign than this step, because now the electron is leaving the dot. And here the electron was coming into the dot. And we repeat the cycle, and uh, we kick out electron no matter the state. Um, and so here the electron left. And we are back to the original state. So we can repeat it 100 times, 1,000 times, 1 million times. And every time, based on whether or not there is a, a little bump here, we'll be able to tell what happened. So now, experimental data. Two traces. Who can tell me the difference? They're the same. No? Is there a difference? Is it a trick question? Well, I didn't think so, but maybe it is. <laughs> uh, 
It's like uh, find uh, 10 differences except there's one difference. <laughs> you know those find 10 difference uh, uh, problems? That's right. It has this bump. So remember, whether or not there's a bump here tells you which spin it is. So um, which spin is, uh, was filled on the left and which spin was filled on the right? So on the right, an electron left the dot and then it came back into the dot. And on the left, nothing happened. Electron did not leave the dot. So what, 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 which state did we have here? Spin up. Spin down. That's right. And the electron then comes back in because uh, it can go back. It can leave from this level and it can go back. Wait a minute. Oh yeah. There was no electron here. The electron was here. It left and then it filled this one. So there is always a step down. Yeah, is that clear? So in this situation, uh, this is kind of a time process. Electron, electron was up yes. uh, at, this, at this level. Electron was spin down. And it could leave. But after some time, another electron could just fill in the lower level. And that's why we have a, a step down. So we can even write a program that analyzes for these bumps has a threshold here. And if something happened above this threshold, uh, it makes a decision. There was a spin up or a spin down. You can write a code because the data is so clear. Or you could also do the following. You can just write, uh, do this uh, pulse sequence one million times and uh, then add all the signals up. And uh, you will have uh, electrons entering the dot and then leaving the dot at different times. So whenever they go into the excited state, uh, they will leave the dot at slightly different times. And the histogram of these times, um, if you vary the waiting time, will tell you the spin relaxation time. So you can, um, you can, for example, vary this time and uh, see if you, how many bumps you have. And if, if this time is too short, there will be no bumps. Oh, sorry, uh, this time, the waiting time. Sorry. You can uh, inject the electron and then vary this time. And if this time is very short, um, there will be very often bumps, maybe every second time. Uh, but if this time is very long, electron will always relax to the ground state, and uh, the bumps will disappear. So uh, if you plot the histogram of how many bumps you have versus the waiting time, you'll get some exponential decay. And from this, you can extract the spin relaxation time T1. I apologize for messing up a bit. Uh, so in this experiment, they found a relaxation time of a millisecond. Uh, that's at 10 Tesla, so at very high field. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's a fairly long time, actually, because if we can control a single spin in 10, 20 nanoseconds, this time will allow us to do many quantum operations. But uh, then subsequent experiments at lower fields uh, were able to observe spin relaxation times up to one second in gallium arsenide. So uh, the point is this relaxation time is long. It's not a problem. Remember, spin relaxation time is a process where you go from the excited state to ground state and you give away energy. So that's T1 type decoherence. <laughs> now we can do single shot readout in this intuitive way 
create an energy difference and see if the electron uh, comes and goes. That's very nice um, to understand the principle. It's not very practical to go forward because we had to create this huge energy difference between the two. And uh, yes, the spin relaxation time is still small. Um, so that's OK. But this energy difference corresponds to a huge frequency, if you convert it by h nu, of uh, 30 gigahertz. And just from the technical point of view, applying such microwave pulses at such high frequencies is very technically difficult. Things get uh, way harder above, uh, let's say, 20 gigahertz when standard microwave components stop working. Um, and they're already pretty hard at a few gigahertz. Um, so this was not a very practical way. And now if we create, made this energy separation smaller, maybe a few gigahertz, then we could not overcome temperature. And we could not distinguish spin down from spin up in these experiments. So then came the idea to use a spin blockade to perform spin to charge conversion. So add a second electron and uh, use it as a kind of a charge magnetometer. So once again, a reminder um, of uh, spin blockade principle. Um, we have added a second dot. In the previous slide, we had one dot. Now we have two dots. And uh, we align the levels in 1, 1 to 0, 2 states, so with two electrons in this system, such that uh, electron on the right dot is uh, way down here, and maybe in the ground state, so spin up. And the triplet state on this dot is way up in energy, unaccessible. So then when electron fills from the left lead with the same spin, uh, it cannot tunnel, assuming spin conservation, because it has no energy to go to triplet, and it's not allowed to go to the singlet 0, 2 state because it has the wrong spin. But then we also discussed uh, what spin resonance does to this. Spin resonance can do this. It can take the spin up, turn it, and then it, it can go. So spin uh, blockade, this arrangement of levels, allows us to distinguish spin up from spin down. And uh, nowhere here we need a huge Zeeman energy. We don't need to, to go to 10 Tesla to see this effect. So in practice, um, this is how they've done it in gallium arsenide. Um, here you can see the gates from the quantum dot, the double quantum dot. And on top of that, they've fabricated this huge coil. And they've passed AC current through this coil, which created AC magnetic field this way. And uh, they apply the external field this way. So the two fields, the large external field, but not 10 Tesla, and the AC magnetic field are perpendicular to each other. And so we are in the spin resonance situation, where we have a large quantizing field and a small AC field going like that. Yeah. So then when we go to the rotating frame, we can start precessing spins. But first, um, we just do what is called a continuous wave experiment. Uh, where we just blast uh, this configuration with microwaves and we get extra current on resonance, on spin resonance, when the Larmor precession frequency of spin uh, is matched uh, by the RF frequency that is applied to the coil. And we've already seen this graph uh, in the lecture on spin orbit interaction. Now this is created by magnetic field and you can see that you see this spin resonance pretty much all the way down to zero magnetic field. Here's 150 millitesla, 50 millitesla can still see it. Yeah. So we don't need huge Zeeman splittings. We can work at a few hundred millitesla or even less. So that's wonderful. And remember the reason it works is because in a double dot system, this transition from here to here 
it's not sensitive to temperature in these leads. So the, the field of 50 millitesla is way below temperature. But because the leads are outside, and here you're tunneling between a discrete state and a discrete state in a quantum dot, uh, you can get uh, sort of sub-temperature effects observed. So spin blockade is great uh, for using qubits. And so actually most modern qubits use spin blockade as a readout mechanism. <clears throat> so then you can also do Rabi oscillations or uh, controlled rotation uh, to create coherent superpositions of spin state up and spin state down. All you need to do is, uh, well, first uh, create the triplet state by just waiting a bit until electrons are filled in this configuration. This becomes your initialization. So rather than relaxation, you just wait until, um, you know, if an electron comes in with a spin down, it will leave, but the second one will be spin up. So you just wait for a time determined by this tunneling barrier for the right spin to come in. And you have initialized in a triplet state. Uh, then you, well, it helps to shift these levels a bit because if you keep these two levels aligned like that and you start applying microwaves, as soon as the spin rotates a little bit, it will go. So you cannot control the angle of its rotation because as soon as it acquires a singlet component, it will couple to this level. So very easy, just displace it such that it cannot go for a bit. And now you're free to rotate the spin by as much as you like. You can rotate it from up to the plane, from up to down, or the full rotation, whatever you like. It will not go anywhere. It's blocked by charge, by Coulomb blockade. So you rotate it a couple of times. And then you bring the level back down, and if it's the right spin, it will go and contribute to current. You repeat it a thousand times, and you get these, uh, again, oscillations, Rabi oscillations, where on this axis, we have the time for which we rotated the spin under the influence of microwaves. So the power we apply to the microwave source makes these oscillations go faster. You see, this is the power. As you increase the power, oscillations are faster. Here is what it's plotted, the frequency of oscillations, called the Rabi frequency. And it's in the megahertz range here, versus power, current, actually square root power. It's a linear trace. That's also very easy to understand. And power or current in that uh, microwave coil is just the magnitude of the AC magnetic field. And the magnitude of AC magnetic field, its amplitude, if you go into the rotating frame, it just means that it gr you grow a field around which you precess. So if the field around which you precess is larger, you precess faster in this plane. Yeah. And if the amplitude is lower, you precess slower. So this is what happens here. Uh, and this is a good test that your oscillations are Rabi oscillations, if they depend on power in this way. So, as is, yeah? What happens at higher burst times? It looks like the spinning falls off you know, after 500 nanoseconds or something. It doesn't seem to match so well. Uh, here? Yeah, and even the top the, at minus 8 dBm. Uh, but you mean on this side? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can see uh, um, overall, basically, what they've done is they try to fit the, the left part, yeah. and it doesn't always work out on the right side um, yeah, because of uh, decoherence, dephasing. Pretty much here, the noise in these points is not so different from uh, the, the amplitude of the oscillation. And so that's what I wanted to talk about next is, um, as usual, try to extract some numbers from these uh, oscillations. Remember, they tell us 
roughly how many quantum gates we can do in a quantum computer. So the number of oscillations is 5, 8, 7, something like that. Um, actually the same as for charge qubits. At least in this experiment. Yeah? We will see some better ones. Uh, this was a, the first experiment of single spin control in a quantum dot. So it's very important. Uh, the results they achieved are not yet good for quantum computers. Yeah? So how do they go to higher powers? Can you just... So it gets, it gets faster. No, I, here they're actually limited by their equipment. They, they're at the maximum of their... Because you're talking about number of gate operations. But yeah, but you can see, you can see that um, they get faster here. But uh, they uh, last for shorter time. Yeah, so here, these are very slow oscillations. You can clearly trace them to a microsecond. Uh, here, yeah, maybe uh, as well. But uh, if you keep increasing the power, you will just see maybe three, two. And the reason for that is um, photon-assisted tunneling. I did not want to go into details. Uh, I think it's a technical problem uh, with, the, with this kind of spin blockade readout. Uh, it's not inherent to spins in dots. Um, OK, but the second thing I wanted to tell you is that this scale is 1,000 times larger than for charge qubits. For charge qubits, we had also 1,000, 2,000, but that was picoseconds. Now we are in nanoseconds. So we can get much longer coherence times with spins. That's true. Maybe not seconds, not in this experiment. But our control is slow. We slap this coil on a quantum dot. We are driving AC currents. Mm. We cannot get fast enough rotations. So that seems to be a challenge in this experiment. Another thing we need to demonstrate is that we can cre prepare any arbitrary superposition of spin up and spin down. That's called universal control over single spin qubit. So you, uh, that's needed for uh, uh, that universal set of quantum gates for a quantum computer. So the way you do this is uh, by a sequence of pulses that have different phases. Let's go to the block sphere. We start with the spin pointing up. That's our initial point. And then we uh, perform a rotation around x-axis. Uh, it's a Rabi oscillation, uh, but only a half of a half of a period, a quarter period. And we are pointing then in the y direction. Uh, then um, after that, we apply a second rotation uh, around uh, an arbitrary axis in this direction. How do we change the axis? We just add a phase to the second pulse. Now the, these pulses are microwave bursts that drive transitions between spin up and spin down. And in the rotating frame, all we need to do is we are already rotating, so if I'm going to start rotating with a different phase, I'm going to create a, a field around a different axis. Is that clear? So we are doing an AC field, which is uh, imagined as a field that rotates like that. And uh, it just rotates, uh, well, with some phase. So if we go into the rotating frame of the initial pulse, we can uh, designate that uh, phase as a rotation around x-axis. And now I uh, tweak the phase on my microwave control. I'm still in this frame, but now the field is a little bit ahead by 90 degrees. So if I'm in this frame, you are seeing two vectors rotating, but what I'm seeing is that uh, I'm looking here, but the field is here. So just tweak the phase on the microwave generator, and you can rotate around a different axis. Now let's see what happens when you rotate around a different axis. Um, well, if you rotate around the uh, minus x, so 
So in the opposite direction. Uh, then you come back up. If you rotate around Y, nothing happens. Because you're rotating around the axis where you're pointing. If you rotate around X one more time for another same period, you go down. If you rotate around minus Y, nothing happens. So if you plot the final state uh, versus angle, you get this sinusoidal dependence, which is known as a Ramsey fringe. When you see such a Ramsey fringe, uh, you know that you can pre pre prepare any superposition of spin up and spin down imaginable. So with any phase in between the two. So the, the, these four are the extremes of this curve, here, 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 and here. And the points in between are angles in between. OK, um, now we make a connection to the lecture on spin orbit interaction. Uh, because the same experiment can be done by just shifting the dot back and forth and inducing an AC magnetic field via spin orbit coupling. They have done it in gallium arsenide. Uh, and uh, they have obtained Rabi oscillations. Uh, they obtained uh, roughly the same coherence time of a microsecond. But now this control is uh, slower. It's about um, five times slower than with magnetic field. And that's not a big surprise, because the spin orbit interaction in gallium arsenide is very weak. Spin orbit length is at 10 microns. So it's, uh, it's not so strong. So then this is actually a, a work that I was involved in. We decided to improve upon that. And we did uh, this uh, electric field control in different semiconductors, indium arsenide and indium antimonide. Here are the two graphs showing Rabi oscillations. Well, we do the same experiment, initialize in the triplet, then uh, isolate and rotate for a fixed time. And then we go to readout and see if it's a singlet or a triplet. And the current uh, uh, oscillates like that. So we get uh, Rabi oscillations. And um, well, uh, we get them uh, to be very fast. So remember. Rabi frequencies in gallium arsenide were 10 megahertz. And for electric Rabi oscillations, that was uh, just 3 megahertz or 2 megahertz. Um, and we get 100 megahertz. So the, the time for a single gate is very short. Unfortunately, what we also found is that the time for which we see the oscillations is also 10 times shorter. So we got the thing to be 10 times faster. Because that seems to be the limitation in gallium arsenide. Because uh, we, we had a microsecond coherence time, but we could only do a few oscillations. It's kind of slow. OK, now let's do them faster. We do them 10 times faster, but they die 10 times faster. So we arrive to roughly the same point. But uh, there is uh, interesting physics behind it. And the physics has to do with why these oscillations decay. Well, they decay because of uh, dephasing due to nuclei. And uh, this is a good uh, demonstration of that, because in gallium arsenide, nuclear spins are smaller than in indium arsenide. And therefore, they allow the electron state to live longer. And they're smaller by something like a factor of three. And uh, various uh, hyperfine processes depend on spin squared. So we get exactly a factor of 10 from just this nuclear spin being larger in indium than in gallium. And uh, so we uh, have Rabi oscillations that decay 10 times faster. So you see, uh, the goal for qubits is to uh, observe many Rabi oscillations, as many as you can. And you can go about two ways. You can increase the coherence time, or you can make the oscillations go faster. But you, you have to do one of the two and not lose the other one. So this is what happened here. We made it faster, but we lost the coherence time. Now I'm going to discuss um, the composite qubits made of two electrons. So these are different quantum states than 
uh, we talked about for the first half of the lecture. And I will show you that in this system, uh, by very clever tricks, they were able to keep fast control and extend coherence time at the same time. And they did not go, have to go to new semiconductor. They just stuck with gallium arsenide. This is gallium arsenide. So they were successful. They use these two quantum states of a two electron system. Well, actually, these are already familiar to you. I reintroduced them today already when I talked about spin blockade. And spin states of two electrons, triplets, up, up and down, down, and uh, this uh, triplet zero, which is a superposition, and a singlet. So they propose to use specifically these two as the ground state and the excited state of a two electron qubit. Now, this is the comparison. This is what we talked about in the first part of the lecture. A superposition of spin up and spin down. Now we put spin up on the north pole of the block sphere and spin down on the south pole of the block sphere. And we were discussing how we can go from this to this and how we can create an arbitrary superposition on this block sphere, which is the single spin control required for quantum computing. In the case of uh, seeing the triplet qubits, uh, this is how the block sphere looks. And we can rotate it by 90 degrees. Uh, doesn't matter. We have to position uh, states uh, that I showed in the last graph like this. Singlet and triplet are the two opposite states, the ground and then the excited state. Um, now, they are made of these blocks, up, down, plus down, up. So we can uh, position the up, down, and down, up orthogonal. You can uh, take singlet plus triplet and get this or this, or you can get this plus this and get triplet or singlet, depending on the phase. It doesn't matter. So this block sphere can also be tilted by 90 degrees. That, that also teaches you that uh, uh, you can uh, define your qubit the way you like. And so here, a spin control was this little AC magnetic field that went perpendicular to the Zeeman splitting and you could ch change the phase of that field. Here, controls are somewhat different. They have to do with a difference between the two dots. One of the controls you have is a gradient between uh, Zeeman splittings and the two dots. For whatever reason it occurs, and it does, this gradient distinguishes up down from down up. That's very easy to see. Uh, if you have different Zeeman splitting here than here, there will be a different energy for this state than for this state. Because yeah? uh, you have to, um, in this case, take the high energy from here, a low energy from here, and a high energy from here. And in this case, you have to take the high energy from here and the low energy from here. Yeah. And the high and the low are different in the two dots. And this guy, I will explain in the next slide. This is exchange coupling between the two electrons. Turns out that controls transitions from triplet to singlet. This is how it works. I plot again, like I did for charge qubits in the beginning of the lecture, energy level diagram around the charge degeneracy point but not between 0, 1, and 1, 0, but between 1, 1, and 0, 2. So the difference is that around this transition, we have all these spin levels, whereas we didn't for 0, 1, 1, 0. But the principle is the same. Here's the detuning axis, which tunes us from this configuration, the 1, 1, to this configuration, 0, 2, where both electrons prefer to be on the same dot from electrostatic point of view. And the levels that we have are singlets, 1, 1, and 0, 2, and those singlets anticross by tunnel coupling between the two dots. 
So those are the blue line, the blue and the gray are the singlet states. That's completely analogous to 0, 1 and 1, 0 charge transition. Because spin is kind of out of the problem here because uh, both of these levels have the same spin. Spin singlet and spin singlet. Now the triplet levels don't anti-cross with singlet, they just go. And now the exchange interaction is the difference between singlet and the triplet. This energy difference that you can create around zero detuning will be the control. So this is how it works. You can sweep your qubit down here and here the 1-1 one, one singlet and the 1-1 one, one triplet are degenerate. And so you can initialize your system maybe in some superposition of the two. But then if you bring it here the system will start evolving between the two levels. So this is the principle between control of a singlet triplet qubit. Shift uh, from here to here to here. So initialize maybe here in a singlet O2. Bring here. Bring here. So you can also read out by pulsing here and then if you're in a triplet you'll go here, and if you're in a singlet, you'll go here. So this is how these qubits uh, work. You pulse them across the zero detuning, and you electrically control whether they are triplet or singlet. You can get Rabi oscillations also this way. This is the first measurement from 2005. Uh, so again, you have not so many oscillations. Like I told you, they have improved tremendously this qubit by now. Um, sort of the initial work is still a few oscillations on the time scales of uh, nanoseconds. So these oscillations are fast. These are as fast as charged qubits. You can get a single um, spin operation in about 100 picoseconds here. But they, in this case, they're short-lived. And um, the way to visualize what happens here in these oscillations is uh, to imagine that uh, this exchange coupling takes two spins when you are at far detuning and they are not coupled. And then you bring them to zero detuning and you bring the two spins close together and they start interacting and they flip uh, like that. So as if they, the two electrons swap their spin states and then you bring them apart again to read out. So this is the intuitive picture behind these Rabi oscillations. And like usual, here you vary the time when the two electrons are close together near zero detuning when you have exchange interaction between singlet and triplet. Now actually, um, for, for a single spin qubit or a two spin qubit, uh, there is no difference uh, in terms of the basic de dephasing because uh, in both cases uh, these electrons interact with millions of nuclei via hyperfine interaction. So just as a reminder, in the area of one quantum dot you have um, about a million nuclei and those nuclei are coupled to the electron with coupling strengths A. This is the nuclear spin and the electron spin and these coupling strengths are so, such that in a gallium arsenide they are equivalent to about 5 tesla. But because you have a million of them and all these eyes are random, this average is down. Um, and that gives you, this term gives you a uh, total nuclear field which shifts your spin resonance frequency, for example, and spin energy levels. And as they fluctuate, the Rabi frequency fluctuates. And uh, after a fixed time of evolution, spins arrive always to a different point because Rabi frequency oscillates. And therefore, you lose uh, spin coherence. So regardless of whether it's a qubit like that or a qubit like that, they have plotted uh, the decay of uh, spin signal. This is a um, 
this Ramsey experiment. So you rotate like that, and then you let it evolve, and then you probe. And um, in both cases, they got dephasing times from that experiment in the tens of nanoseconds. And that is consistent with uh, the broadening of this nuclear field distribution, if you do the math. So here is a, an, another slide on the fundamentals of hyperfine. Um, the way electron interacts with this million nuclei is uh, uh, illustrated with this uh, fine line here. The blue line is the envelope of the wave function. But the wave function of an electron in a conduction band uh, is, um, is a sum of uh, s orbitals uh, tied to each atom in a lattice, in a, in, a, in a lattice. So actually, if you go inside the envelope, uh, you will get um, peaks at the positions of every nucleus. That's because electrons in the conduction band have S-wave symmetry, so each wave function around each nucleus is a Gaussian like that. So this is the worst possible situation for hyperfine. Hyperfine is the strongest because the wave function of the electron has these peaks at the positions of the nuclei. So the coupling strength between the electron and the nuclear wave functions is very large. And uh, this is the same math as in the last slide. The total is a sum over all nuclei. And uh, you can convert it into a magnetic field or magnetic moment by uh, summing up over all nuclear spins. And you get something like a 2 millitesla. And the problem is that uh, the AC magnetic field that, for example, they've created in a Delft experiment is also of the order of 2 millitesla. So you have an a AC drive, which is trying to rotate spins, and you have on top of that a fluctuating nuclear field, which is the same strength. So you get uh, not very good results, because uh, uh, every time you try to rotate spins, there is about an, the same offset in a different direction, actually in a random direction. So that's why this uh, dephasing is so efficient and such a big problem. Now let's learn a bit more about the nuclear system and semiconductors. Um, there are very interesting time scales inside that system. See, the nuclear spins themselves, um, they um, don't interact as strongly. So if you just take the magnetic coupling, for example, a magnetic field created by this nuclear spin, how does it act on this nuclear spin? Um, well, that's a time scale of a fraction of a millisecond. So that's a dipole-dipole interaction. That tells you uh, if you um, what time do you have to wait until two nuclei exchange spin like that, but only just by virtue of uh, magnetic fields that go through space. So here is one time scale. Uh, the next one is spin diffusion, so kind of a tr transfer of spin to the next nucleus, maybe through some overlap. And uh, so, for example, how long it takes for this excitation to travel out of the dot. Well, that's just super long. You can even probe it with your eye. You can measure the system and see how they diffuse out. Larmor precession is uh, a little bit faster, but still nothing compared to um, an electron. Energy phasing is very long. So the message of this slide is that Nuclei are a problem if your measurement takes a second or longer. You will average over many states of these nuclei. But if you measure fast, you will be able to see snapshots of the system which are much more coherent than you think. And the second message is that uh, these nuclei, they're kind of like manatees. They are uh, very slow, not going anywhere. And so we can try to hoard them. We can try to manipulate them into a state that we want. 
because they are actually on the time scale of a qubit, they're not doing anything. Our time scales that we care about are nanoseconds. And the nuclei are just pretty much static on those time scales. So we can use hyperfine coupling in reverse mode. What if we could uh, take electrons, and electrons go very fast through the dot, and prepare a different state of nuclei? So kind of reverse engineer hyperfine interaction. Uh, because hyperfine interaction has two terms, electron spin times nuclear spin. So if we always flip electron spins, say, from up to down, as we go through spin blockade, that's what happens. Uh, we can start creating uh, more and more nuclear spins which are pointing up through this process. So let's send a million electrons through the dot and maybe all the nuclear spins will be pointing up. So that's the idea behind trying to control the nuclear subsystem and that's what led to the success of a Harvard group in prolonging the coherence times in gallium arsenide. Now we have to be careful. Um, what matters for us is not just a nuclear polarization flipping spins uh, up, because uh, naively that would just shift this distribution to a larger average. So if we don't do anything, this average is at zero. But then if we try to polarize nuclear spins, this average might just shift. That is actually not useful. Because here we have the same fluctuations just around the different point. So the qubit will experience the same randomness in nuclear fields and the same dephasing. What we care about is whether we could prepare a nuclear state which is less fluctuating, a narrower distribution, narrower than the natural distribution given by the square root of n. So there is a way. Once again, or maybe this is the first time I show it, but this is how um, several groups have tried to polarize uh, nuclear subsystems. They uh, pulse electron across this anti-crossing between uh, triplet and singlet. This is a triplet plus, and uh, if you want to go across and leave the quantum dot, you have to flip the spin of the electron. And that spin has to go somewhere. So the hope is that it would go to the uh, nucleus. So then if you go through this anti-crossing and go from triplet to singlet, let's look at it again. Triplet to singlet, you would have to rotate one of the nuclei and try to polarize them one way. It turns out that uh, they can uh, perform this process so efficiently uh, that they can create nuclear polarizations, but then they, because nuclei are so slow, they can measure the new nuclear polarization uh, by offsets, for example, in the spin resonance, uh, and then they can decide whether they are happy or not. And so they can implement kind of a feedback, logic feedback loop into whether they need to narrow more or narrow less. So they have done these feedback experiments, and these are the amazing results. This is their qubit before they do anything. So just uh, nuclear spins completely random, unprepared. And then they run a feedback cycle, and they can extend uh, the amplitude and the duration of these oscillations by a factor of 10. So that's pretty great. And this is... Uh, their nuclear distribution. So it was wide, they, they apply feedback, and they narrow it. Turns out that you don't even need to do this computer uh, process where you measure the uh, uh, nuclear gradient and then feed it back. Uh, but you can just set up the levels in a quantum dot in a clever way that there is a fixed point that tries to narrow the distribution. So if the gradient grows, it tries to pump it down. If it grows in the other direction, it tries to pump it up. Um, so it tries to narrow this gradient just by the arrangement of levels. So I would love to discuss that, but we don't have time for that. So I refer you to this paper. 
what I want to say for this lecture is that this group have succeeded in narrowing the distribution of nuclear spins and observe enhancement in how long Rabi oscillations go for. And then uh, the remaining uh, randomness, they could remove it by a spin echo procedure. Remember spin echo from last lecture, you rotate into the xy plane, and then you let it evolve for time t, and then you do a pi pulse, where you reverse the effect of a random field, and if the spins were precessing this way, now they're precessing back and refocusing uh, for any random distribution. So they perform this sequence, and they get an amazing result that the coherence time of this qubit, they were able to enhance it to 30 microseconds. And remember, the evolution of one gate is still 100 picoseconds. Then they uh, try to play this game even longer. Um, this is the one spin echo, so they evolve the system for time tau, they do a pi pulse and it refocuses, but uh, then it's refocused at this point, well then they just let it evolve again, do another pi pulse and another one, and that's called a CPMG sequence. So this is the generalization of a spin echo uh, where you're trying to keep the system coherent by refocusing pulses for as long as you can. And with that uh, CPMG sequence of 16 pulses, so 16 of these pulse pulses, 16 refocusing events, they extended the coherence time to uh, approaching 300 microseconds. So if we take this number and divide it by this number, we get a huge number of gates. We get on the order of 1,000. And that's when we can start talking about doing quantum computing. So we started from uh, realizing that spin qubits may have advantages. Then we learned how to control single spin states. We ran into some problems that either the control is slow or coherence time is too short. And then by a combination of these tricks, go to sing the triplet qubits, do some feedback on the nuclear system. They were able to achieve these results. And this is kind of the state of the art in the field of spin qubits in terms of the number of potential quantum operations. So these are the numbers. Um, all the DiVincenzo criteria can be uh, in principle uh, realized in a system of spin qubits. Uh, you can do very good preparation, um, a decent readout. This, these numbers have improved since these slides were made. Uh, you can do fast control of a single qubit and two qubits. Um, and the dephasing times and relaxation times um, are kind of nice. So now the, the next step is to start putting together two qubits, three qubits, try to build a quantum computer. For just one more minute, I want to tell you that um, another approach that the field is following right now is uh, to get rid of nuclear spins altogether. Why do we have to do all these feedback procedures and try to narrow them? If we can go for a semiconductor, not a gallium arsenide, but some other semiconductor, for example, silicon and carbon have no nuclear spins. So recently, a couple of experience, experiments came up um, where they use uh, a silicon as a matrix for a spin qubit. Uh, this is an experiment from Australia where this is a silicon substrate, and they have embedded, actually stuck a single ion of phosphorus into the silicon matrix. And then they are reading out uh, this ion with a nearby uh, SET, single electron transistor. So they were also able to observe uh, Rabi oscillations in this system uh, induced by this coil. Um, so this, uh, there is a huge promise in this system because in silicon, that's where all these coherence times of a second were observed. Uh, but it looks like they still have a long ways to go because their starting point, these initial experiments, 
Again, we see a time scale of a microsecond for Rabi oscillations uh, and uh, just a few oscillations. So here they clearly have a problem that for whatever reason, uh, still this qubit is uh, short-lived and the control is not so fast. So they're going to have to go through some process of improving this qubit. Another uh, example is from a, a company in the US. It's a military company called HRL. Uh, they have created a, a header structure based on silicon. It's a silicon, silicon germanium quantum well, like gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, but now with silicon. And so potentially with no nuclear spins. And they have created a double quantum dot and observed Rabi oscillations in a single triplet qubit. So in a two electron qubit. Yeah, these also look a little bit better because uh, they extend to about 10 microseconds, whereas in uh, gallium arsenide was all located down here to one microsecond initially. And uh, they become fast. This is the effect you asked about. They keep increasing the, the rate and the oscillations get faster, but they don't live so long. And that's because of photon assisted tunneling. But still, this does not fulfill the promise of silicon yet. Because what we want to see is oscillations going on for a millisecond and being fast. So, but this is a very promising direction, also something I want to look at here in Pittsburgh, doing spin qubits with silicon. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs>